Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Today, much of the world's fossil fuel reserves will be worthless if world governments ever get it together to fulfill a pledge to cap emissions. And yet, look at the market. Even as governments are supposedly preparing for a deal to protect the climate, investors are still investing in carbon assets. It all bodes to either a climate catastrophe, if there's no cut on emissions, or a carbon asset bubble that could be worse than the subprime mortgage crash if there is a deal. So are there any other options? To help us grapple with that, we've welcomed back, we're welcoming back, John Fullerton. He's the president and co-founder of the Capital Institute, and he's been writing about this carbon asset bubble for a while. John, welcome. Thanks, great to be back. Glad to have you. So tell me where we're at, John, climate-wise to begin. Where's the clock vis-a-vis -vis our climate? Well, I was just at a meeting in, in Denmark where the uh, chairman of the IPCC gave a presentation uh, to tell us that, and, and I'm afraid it was not an optimistic report. Um, the, um, the science has only continued to get more clear and, uh, and that humans are causing climate change. It's happening now. And I think the important piece of this latest report is that continuously the science is trying to catch up with actually the rate of change. Mm. So we've systematically, because science is inherently conservative, we've consistently underestimated the rate of change. And that's, um, that's now becoming uh, more apparent to, to the scientific community. All right, so say I had a broker, one, and say I went to <laughs> him or her and asked him or her, her advice for my stock portfolio this year or next, what would she or he be likely to say? Well, you'd be lucky if she or he had thought about the issue. I think the, um, the reality is that climate change and finance are still very much viewed as separate worlds disconnected from each other. And so if you're lucky, uh, your broker would have begun to think about it and would be aware that there's a growing uh, concern even about, um, you know, his or her very own business, which is what do I tell my clients about their exposure to this, um, to this growing, uh, growing risk in, in terms of how it will impact their portfolio. Because if you look at some of the most profitable companies on the Forbes list of the top 10, I think half of them are energy companies, BP, Shell. Shell's the top one, I think. Yeah, the, the energy business is a profitable business. In, in many ways, what an energy company is, is a expert at investing capital in a prudent way from the perspective of financial returns because they need to have extremely long time horizons amid lots of uncertainty. And so the skill set they become very good at in addition to the engineering is investing capital. Um, so they're, they tend to be profitable and, uh, and if oil prices are strong, they tend to be extremely profitable. So let's buy some stocks. Well, that was a good theory 10 years ago. And to go back to the time trajectory, the, the research was done well over six years ago um, about two and a half years ago, an organization in the UK called Carbon Tracker uh, took the original fundamental research and, and expressed it in, a, in an extremely powerful, user-friendly way with good graphics and came out with this idea uh, and presented it as a carbon bubble and talked specifically about the investment risk of the shares of the public companies that own fossil fuel reserves. That's where they focused on. And they presented it as a market risk and, and focused on market regulators, particularly in the UK where a lot of oil companies trade. Um, and so what they were saying is there's this undisclosed risk that if we get our policy act together, um, these fossil fuel based companies are susceptible to significant decline in value. And they, the share of the UK stock market is dom not dominated, but significantly concentrated in oil stocks. And therefore, the European and particularly UK pension funds have a lot of exposure to this risk. Mm. And it was a very effective strategy um, that then made its way to the, you know, the mass mobilization movement that you talked about. Bill McKibben did a great job uh, marshalling it with a, with a, a really important um, article he wrote uh, called Do the Math. And, um, uh, but it really started before that. It started, to my knowledge, at Swarthmore College. Right. Uh, focused on coal probably a year and a half mm. before the carbon tracker report came out. So it just gives us an idea of how long it takes for these ideas to move from science into the mainstream. And in fact, um, even though it's now in the mainstream, most mainstream investors are still dismissing it mm. as 
kind of a not our issue. It's a political issue, not an investment issue. So one of the things that's prodding people to even think about this subject is a student movement that's growing up mm -hmm. around the country calling for fossil-free investments mm -hmm. and sort of call, and calling for divestment by colleges yeah. uh, along the lines of the campaigns that saw divestment from South Africa right. years ago. Here's a quick video that kind of lays out where the campaign is at. It's a trailer for a longer movie. Check it out. A new movement is sweeping across college campuses and universities around the United States, Canada, and the world. Fossil fuel divestment. Last fall, students from across the country came together to launch the Go Fossil Free divestment campaign. We quickly spread to over 300 colleges and universities across the country. We spent our first fall semester building power, creating groups on campuses, learning more about schools' endowments and finances, presenting to our boards of trustees, and coming together for regional convergences. And then in the spring, we hit the ground running. We presented to dozens of boards of trustees, held a national convergence at Swarthmore. We made it into nearly every national news outlet, from the New York Times to This American Life and even Fox News. I'm gonna be dead soon, what the hell do I do? <laughs> and the pressure's beginning to work. Seven schools have already committed to divesting from fossil fuels. And it's not just college campuses. Over 15 cities have committed to divestment, along with a growing number of religious groups. Like the entire National United Church of Christ. And we're just getting started. How are the universities and colleges responding to the fossil free divestment campaign? Well, it's, a, it's certainly a mixed story, um, but um, I, I can report that two of our leading elite uh, Ivy League schools uh, came out and decided not to divest um, from fossil fuels. Um, Brown University, the, the campaign on the campus there was just to focus on coal, which frankly is their easy uh, decision from a divestment point of view. And the president of the school uh, issued a long and thoughtful statement on their decision why they should not invest. And um, to be honest, I, you know, I, I fully sympathize with all of the economic arguments um, I understand the business model of a university like that, um, but I do think if we look back at that letter, maybe even only five years from now, and substitute, for example, the word fossil fuel, perhaps with the word slavery, um, we, will, we will be aghast at how we thought about this issue. Um, within five years, certainly within 10 years, the, the crisis is going to be apparent. and. Um, and again, not that Brown's decision to divest from coal companies is in itself going to change uh, the behavior of the coal industry or the behavior of public politicians. Um, but we need to have the elite uh, universities in particular taking a stand, a moral stand. Um, and similarly, Harvard came out and different set of arguments, but basically the same fundamental economics requires us to do this. Um, determined that they wouldn't divest from fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I think, um, I think our, our, our leading institutions have let us down. Well, they, they dismissed the divest from South Africa campaign, too, for many years. Right, right. But this is fundamentally different than South Africa. I think what we need to grasp is that South Africa was obviously a moral issue. I believe this is a moral issue, and we're only beginning to think of it as a moral issue. But the scale of this overwhelms South Africa. I mean, South Africa is a relatively small economy, and the, the main developed economy world's exposure to South Africa was almost trivial, I would say. This is the fundamental energy system that drives the global economy, uh, on a, and it's a scale that is incom you know, incomparable to any challenge we've had to deal with before. So how on earth is the world of finance going to help us? If, as you described it, it's models, we've, as we've talked before, it's models don't help us. Mm. It's consciousness isn't really there yet, but the clock is ticking. Mm. Um, just divesting from things, I'm assuming, won't be the whole picture. We also have to talk about what to invest in instead. You've been working on that part of this mm. picture as well. What have you come up with? Well, I, I think you're right. The, the answer isn't simply divestment. Um, I think the divestment movement has, has done a fantastic job at shining a light on this issue and, and putting it into um, the mainstream conversation. Uh, 
and you now have the head of the World Bank talking about divestment and fossil or stranded assets, and you have the head of the OECD now talking about a stranded, I, I believe he said a stranded planet or stranded assets. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it has succeeded in moving this conversation into the mainstream. But of course, those that don't favor a divestment strategy can rightly point to the logic that simply by large investors, much less smaller investors, selling their oil stocks isn't going to change how oil stocks invest their capital. Mm -hmm. Exxon hasn't sold stock in I don't know how many decades. Mm -hmm. They invest, they reinvest their own cash flow. So um, divestment is a is a um, it's a it's an agenda setter. It's not an economic strategy. Mm -hmm. um, you asked about how finance can can um, can respond to this. I think. Uh, clearly, there's financial risk management and the tools we understand about financial risk management, which is the future is uncertain and we need to look at a wide range of scenarios in our financial forecasting. Anyone who's doing forward-looking financial research and not trying to begin to factor in the probability and the timing of a real policy um, uh, response to climate change is not doing their job. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and markets tend to be, you know, markets have gotten a really bad name as a result of the financial collapse. But I continue to maintain that markets are actually quite good at anticipating future events that aren't yet logically being discussed. Uh, the stock market in particular and the bond market um, ha have an uncanny ability to discount future issues that aren't on the news every day. And so I personally have divested from my coal and tar sand stocks years ago. Um, and, and oil stocks as well, because I don't want to be the last one mm. to the party, not, not, you know, leaving aside the moral issue, just from a purely financial investment perspective, um, I believe it's only a matter of time before the markets begin to discount this risk. But and, and why wait? People said the housing market was solid as houses, too, <laughs> even as we saw irresponsibly sold mortgages spiraling yeah. into insane um, derivative stocks. Right. That bubble didn't burst until it was ready to crash all over us. Yeah, and, and there, were, there were prescient investors who stayed away from the subprime mortgage market and stayed away from, um, you know, th there are people that began to uh, reduce their exposure to all financial markets because they saw that bubble coming. It's, it's, not, it's simply not true that no one saw mm -hmm. it coming. Um, this is a different kind of bubble, though. Th th that, was a, um, that was a bubble that was um, created through um, systematic fraud. This bubble is not systematic fraud. This is systematic ignorance. And, um, and I think it will take us, unfortunately, longer to process the reality that you know, it, it boils down to exponential growth of the emissions of fossil fuel, CO2, is not consistent with our scientific understanding of a finite bios biosphere. Mm. And no one is, is, there's no fraud involved in that. It's just we're in a collective denial. Um, and can our world economy withstand the kind of hit a carbon asset bubble crash would be? You know, that's a, that's, a, that's a tough question. I wish I could rattle off an easy answer. Um, when I first wrote about this now two years ago, I called my piece our $20 trillion big choice. And, and what I meant by that is that I did a back of the envelope calculation that, that estimated that the current market value of the fossil fuel reserves that we should not be burning at the time was worth about $20 trillion. I think that was a conservative estimate. Now, only, a, only a, a small portion of that, less than half of that, is owned by public companies. So the public market exposure is actually the smaller piece mm -hmm. of the total exposure. Think about the economic exposure of the OPEC countries whose economies are primarily based on selling oil um, or selling fossil fuels. Um, you know, the, the, the subprime crisis caused a direct write-off of, I'm told, $2.7 trillion. Mm -hmm. If my calculation is even roughly correct, absorbing a $20 trillion financial write-off into the economy, even if the banks aren't as exposed to it as they were to subprime, which I think is probably true. I mean, banks have exposure to the energy industry, but I don't think they're holding massive leveraged portfolios of toxic, mm -hmm. risky 
um, you know, they have loans to, to, to small oil companies. They don't have leveraged portfolios of exotic, um, you know, uh, derivative-based um, uh, subprime. But, but 20 trillion is a big number. And even if it's going to be managed through a decade or more, as I said earlier, markets tend to discount these new realities very quickly. Um, so I, I, I don't think we're looking at a situation that's going to be an easy, smooth transition. Mm -hmm. I, I think we're already experiencing the volatility and will continue to. So you're a kind of calm guy. You worked for J.P. Morgan for years. You've been trying to tell this message. You've been saying this, ringing this alarm for years now. Mm. Is this you with your hair on fire? I often feel like I'm helpless. You know, I'm, I'm screaming out the window and no one's listening and everyone's going busy about their work. And, and in particular, the challenge that will be the hardest of this is not the economic absorption of, of, of the loss. It's the consequences of this new reality, which is that all things equal, it's going to be, we're going to have a slower growing economy with more expensive energy. That means all kinds of things beyond the value of oil stocks. Yeah. That means the debt capacity of nation states is probably going to be lower than we currently think it is, which means the debt to GDP problem is worse than we currently think it is. And the cost of the consequences of climate change, you know, the, the cleanup from this hurricane in, in, in the, Philippines. Um, the Philippines, who knows what that's going to be, much less the human loss of life, but just the economic consequences of increasingly regular storms. That's a off-balance sheet liability that's not factored into anyone's um, current, current fiscal situation. So adjusting to the consequences of this are actually going to be as difficult as the direct write-off. But aren't there also opportunities in a transition like this? Yeah, absolutely. And, th and they're already happening. I mean, th there are businesses being built today and fortunes being built today that are riding this transition from fossil fuel-based energy system to a clean, renewable-based energy system. And it's not a straight line, but it is probably the single biggest investment opportunity, business building opportunity in the history of, of civilization. Um, I've seen estimates that suggest over the next 20 years we'll need to invest close to $20 trillion in the energy system alone, and, and another close to $20 trillion in the uh, in water infrastructure. Yeah. And so um, what we need to do is channel capital out of the excessive speculative activity that Wall Street has now become addicted to and into this fundamental and, and morally essential um, real investment flow and, and stop worrying about whether my quarterly returns are being optimized when I do it. We just need to get on with it and we need some leadership to cause that to happen. Well, I know the Capital Institute is working on that, and people can find at our website links to your Big Choice report and some interesting work you've been doing on alternative investment. Thanks, John, for coming in. Sure. Pleasure to be here. Mm -hmm.